In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> Must excuse my voice, I am still recovering from the main flu. Uh, so it's quite a serious one, the one that catches men, but uh, all right. No, who made a roadblock? He still has an <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about, about stewardship this morning, and uh, my focus will be on financial stewardship. Must make it clear that stewardship is not only about money. Um, there's a lot of things that are entrusted in us. And maybe let's start there by just understanding stewardship as a concept. What is it all about? So that we don't limit it to money, right? So if you really think about it, stewardship involves, now this is a definition that I picked up in Wikipedia, right? It says it involves planning, right? It's not a haphazard process. There's planning, there's management, there's growth of whatever has been entrusted to you. So, so back in the days um, when, 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 when kings, uh, obviously kings has, had a lot of wealth, they'll have a steward who looks after that wealth. And their job is to make sure that the wealth preserves its value at, at the least, and at the best it grows in value. And that's really what stewardship is all about. It is about planning, managing, preserving, and growing. Whatever it is. Now, when it talks about planning, when we talk about planning and, and managing, it means that it has to do with competence also. Yeah. You know, you must be competent in managing what has been given to you. Mm -hmm. And competence can be found in many, many ways. You could read up on competence, you could seek with mentors, so that that which you've been asked to manage can grow. Okay, so that's another thing about stewardship. And uh, the Bible says something interesting here. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Colossians 3, verse 23 to 24. Um, as working for the Lord. And, and here's the understanding. As Christians, we should understand that there's nothing in our lives that shouldn't include God. Mm. Nothing, nothing. You see, once, once, once the standard, once the person I want to impress is God, yes. the standard rises higher than everything else. Yes. And, and the, challenge, the challenge with maybe all of us as human beings is that we, we, when we do something and then people applaud us, we think we have arrived. Mm. Such that it becomes our standard to always get the applause. Yet, heaven is silent. You haven't received yeah. an applause from heaven. So our standards as Christians, for anything that we do, is the applaud of God yeah. and nobody else. And, and, the, and the, the shameful part of it is that sometimes you are applauded by people who are incompetent in what you are doing. Yeah. And it's a very low standard to be applauded for. Yeah. You, you can't, I mean, okay, let's leave that. 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 And, 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 so, and so the idea of stewardship as Christians, whether it is your job, it is how you raise children, it's how you run a family, how you make friends, how you evangelize, the point is to be applauded by God. Now look at God. I want to show you that God does pray when we are doing something great. So one time they were building a temple out in, um, in, in Jerusalem, back in the days. And, and you must understand, when, when, when building a temple, and, and here's, the, here's the thing, we like giving everybody a chance in church. Have you noticed that? Say, I want to say, Papa, to see you, Ufagan is suit, Menashumae. And this person is so scared, and then it's going to see Lushevu, Sisha is not a lot. But God understands that whenever you are building something, take people who are competent in that thing, because God has planted that competence in them. Now look at God when he's excited about your competence. So there's this guy who was building, right? So he's called, uh, where's the verse? Where's the verse? His name is Bazalel. So as they were building the temple, God knew that there were people who were skilled. If you go to Exodus 35, verse 35, God is bragging. He's saying, I have filled them with all men of skills. Some, some are engineers, some are this. God fills us with skills, and we become stewards of those skills. So now, when God watches the skill being done the way he desires, when God watches that, the skill is being managed at the highest level. Look at how he breaks. Look at him. Look at him here. Okay, he says this. This is found in Exodus 31, verse 2 to 5. Look, I have specifically chosen Basil, son of Ur, grandson of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him extra wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of craft. He is the master craftsman. Can you imagine God calling you a master? Hey. Hmm. Once your standard is high, you really don't care what people say. Hmm. God calls this guy, I mean, God calling someone a master. And, and he goes on, and I mean, God bragging. Just imagine God just bragging about what he sees in us when we start being good stewards. Now look at what he says. He's an expert working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and carrying out wood. He is a master of every craft. How many times has God called this guy a master in a few verses? 
And that's what stewardship means. Stewardship is, is doing its best when God can applause and break. Right. Now, you know, he prayed about Job also. Mm-hmm. Which means that sometimes when God breaks, the devil gets irritated and troubles you. Yeah. Sometimes when you are troubled, it's not because things are just not going well. God has breaked and the devil is unhappy. Mm-hmm. But then we can overcome, right? And stewardship also is about growing what we have been given. Growing what we have been given. Now, we always think that stewardship is about money. But I've just demonstrated to you that it's also about your skills. Mm-hmm. Stewardship is about your skills. Stewardship is about, is about your health. You know when it says, your body is the temple of the Lord? It already to- tells you who's the owner. Because yeah. stewardship says, I am not the owner, I look after. So even our body, the stewardship of the body, stewardship of health, the stewardship there. The stewardship, when you think about children, God gives us the children. And we are stewards. That's why they are a blessing from God. We are stewards and we account for it. So their preservation and their growth depends on us. Remember, stewardship is about planning. So we don't just have children, we plan, right? It's not oops. Is it? Well, I hope in, in future we don't do oops. We, we plan. One time I'll show you how expensive children are. Maybe you should, should see the numbers. Then, then, then you want, we don't want to be like, uh, like, 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 like Jacob. Right. So, so for stewardship, of, <coughs> I think we all look, look up to biblical characters. <laughs> right. There's also stewardship of family. That's why the, the Bible tells you that a wife is a gift from the Lord. And there's stewardship there. There's stewardship on the, on the crafts that we have, but all require competence. Now, what gives us competence when it comes to money? What gives us competence when it comes to everything God has entrusted in us? And I want to say to you that we have a manual called the Bible. Yeah. You know, you'll be surprised that there is nothing that pertains to your life. Any portion of your life, whether you think about health, you think about business, you think about raising children, you think about money, everything that you need to know is in the Bible. It's in the Bible. The reason why you don't know it's in the Bible, you have not read your Bible. Yeah. <laughs> right? Now, now so, so the Bible throughout this, throughout this day, between now and the sermon, will be our guide. Our source will be the Bible. It's enough. There is no need to take concepts from heathens and baptize them with the best. The Bible is enough. Okay. Okay. The Bible is enough. Powerful. Now, now the, thing with, the thing with the Bible is that it seems that God always wants, you know, the demands that God has, sometimes they look unrealistic, don't they? Mm-hmm. They really look unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the thing. Eleanor, Eleanor writes something and she says, <coughs> his biddings are his enablings. In other words, when he gives a command, the command doesn't go empty-headed. It comes with power mm-hmm. to do. So whatever you read in the Bible and it seems impossible, it's not your problem. Okay. That commandment has come with power. The problem with us, we don't tap into that power. We reason too much and not tap into the power. Mm-hmm. Now, now look at Philippians. Maybe you think Ellen White, some of you don't believe in Ellen White. So let's go to the Bible, it's fine. And I told you, the Bible is enough. The Bible is enough. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Look at how exciting this thing is. The Bible says, it is God who works in you and gives you the desire mm-hmm. to do the right thing mm-hmm. and the power to do. Look at this. Have you noticed that there are times when you just don't feel like doing what God wants? Yes. Let's be honest. I know you're in church, you think you're holy. But, but it happens. It happens. Yes. You know, I, I, I know I shouldn't do this, but I, I, I don't have a desire not to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, look at what Paul is saying. Paul must have struggled with this. And then he discovered that God actually plants the desire. Some of our prayers must be God, I don't feel like doing this thing. Make me feel like doing it. Because yeah. Yeah. when you don't feel like doing something, Forget about the power to do. You just didn't feel like doing it. So the Bible is teaching us that God even plants the desire. And not just the desire. So he plants this yearning for his will. When you see people running around and and looking for, I mean, look at the wealthy people. They're now giving money away. Because there's a desire. They're just not sure where to direct it. Right? Have you have you seen someone who's who's a drug addict and you've written them off, but every now and then he still comes back home. We, We still sleep so there's a desire. But we, we are ignoring that desire. So, so one of our prayers must be, can, can God just plant a desire for me to do his will? Yes. Okay? So, 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 so the Bible also emphasizes that. But also, after the desire, what happens? The power also to do. It's almost like we just sit and become available as Christians. So the Bible will be our source. Another source of ours will be um, Ellen White, so that you are all happy. So Ellen White... <laughs> You know, 
one of the things that, that is amazing about God, that, that's when you see that God had always given us solutions for our lives. We've just ignored them. Mm-hmm. When, I, when, I, when I teach people how to get out of debt, I purely use Ellen White. Like, Ellen White has like eight steps out of debt. And I always wonder, the people who read Ellen White very much in, in the comment page, why do they skip these chapters? Because these chapters also teach us how to manage our money. So, so you'll realize that God already, I mean, Ellen White wrote these things in 18 Tonsamet, right? Very long time ago. But these things are relevant as if they were written this morning. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. What has just happened? Okay, that's fine. We can do it. Please don't start a song. Yes, that's important. Really. <laughs> I get challenged with silence is reflect. <laughs> you don't need to start a song all the time. <clears throat> all right. Where is my friend here? Yeah, the projector is on. We just need to redo this. Okay. There we go. <laughs> no, no, no songs. <laughs> Let's enjoy the awkwardness of silence. <laughs> Every time something is happening, someone starts a song. No, don't do it. Respect the songs, man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. We'll also look at a bit of some of the research that has been done about finances. Um, we'll also, by the way, use common sense. Because obviously, the interest rate of South Africa is not in the Bible. So we must use common sense for that. So, so if you don't see a verse for the interest rate, please, we are using common sense. Is that okay? So those are our sources. Those are our sources, right? Now, let's talk about money a bit. The Bible has, you know, the Bible is enough. That's the point I want to make this morning. And then in the sermon, we'll, we'll speak about your favorite things, uh, tithe and all that. Right. Did you know that there's over 2,000 verses in the Bible that speak about money and possessions? You might just know five, the ones that are read every Sabbath, mm. threatening you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's over 2,000 that talk about money. And, and you know the point here is that by the time God asks you to return tithe, he has taught you how to make 100% yes, from which 10%. So he has spent time in the Bible teaching you how to manage money. So that when, he, when, he, when he asks you to return tithe, he's not asking you without having helped you to build. Mm-hmm. That's God. That's God. 2,000 verses. And just 500 on prayer and faith. I mean, it's almost like God knew that. Yes, that was when he gave him a because even our prayers, give me, give me. So it deals with it, 2,000 verses. So by the time you pray, you pray for your salvation, you are sorted. Mm. You are sorted. Mm. But also, some of us are closer to God when we are broke. Yeah. Once we are sorted, <laughs> I'll figure out afternoon program, such a mild pain. <laughs> Did you also know that about two thirds, two thirds of Christ's parables were about money and possessions? Okay. A sower went to sow. That's agriculture, the economy. Mm. The, 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 the prodigal son asked for wealth. Mm. It, just look at them, the lost coin. Um, you know, many, many things. Two thirds of his parables have been about money. Yet Christians are broke, Christians are in debt, but they're reading the Bible. Mm. But here's the, the other challenge that we have. We tend to, myself included, we tend to, to, to read the Bible and interpret it to suit our position in life. Mm-hmm. So, so, so you get a person who is mismanaging their money, and then they quote you this verse, Matthew 6, verse 24. Um, <clears throat> now until then, no one can serve two masters. You will either be devoted to the one and despise the other, love the other and hate the other. You can't serve both God and money, said the broke person. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so... So, so we get to a point where we, we, instead of learning how to manage our money and get out of debt, we say, I, I might be broke, but at least I'm not saving money, I'm saving God. But let's think about this thing now. I want us to, to, to also learn to read the Bible. Don't read it like you're reading a Bona magazine. A Bona magazine has nothing to, to do with you. you bono bongan, bonang, bayapila, gamnan, nothing to do with you. The Bible has everything to do with us. When we read the Bible, let's read our lives. What is God saying to me? Right. Can I ask a question? No one is going to be disfellowship. How many of us hate being broke? You know that moment, that moment where, where you are so broke, you can't even get... Okay, thank you. 
<laughs> you know when you give us some money. <laughs> no, 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 no. I will, I will give you. I will give some biblical verses to help you with that. Now, but just the feeling that you have when you've ran out of money, you can't even buy bread, you can't even pour petrol, and sometimes you even feel it in your stomach. So, oh, yes. So, now, hold on to that feeling. That feeling that you just felt of anxiety, of stress, because you are, you are without money. How many of us have the same feeling? Don't raise your hand. How many of us have the same feeling when a day passes, I haven't read my Bible, I haven't prayed? How many of us get equally stressed when we are without God as we are when we are without money? So, who's your master? So that's what this verse is saying. The verse is saying that serve God, not money. How do we serve money? We get to a point where we are more stressed to be without money than we are to be without God. Then money has become the master. That's what this verse is saying. The verse is not saying be broke to prove that you honor God. The one thing that I'd want us, I'd want us to take out of this thing is that we need to start learning to, to use money, the tool, to serve God, the master. And not to use God to serve money. Yes. Where, where, where we are coming to church because we are in trouble, we want prayers. Once we are sorted, we go back to our master. Mm. Where God has been used so you can serve the master. Mm. Right? So that's what I want us to pick up this, this, this morning if we miss anything else. Okay. One thing I also want us to agree on is that money is a tool. Mm. It is not the thing itself. It is the tool to build whatever you're building. Okay? The thing with tools... Let's just think, I mean, many of you have cars. How many of us have ever sat down and read the manual? My see. You see? So there are many things that we just, we buy them and we start using them without understanding how they should be used. Right? Money is like that. Money, because it's a tool, if you don't know how to use the tool, have you noticed that a tool that you don't know how to use can hurt you? Mm. Oh, yes. That's true. And money is exactly like that. If you don't understand how money works, it becomes a tool that hurts you. Mm. What do I mean by hurting you? Every now and then you graduated, you started a job, and then you start getting calls. You are amongst the, the top 1%. You qualify for this and that. Because you don't understand the tool, it starts to hurt you. By the time you are done, you are over indebted. Mm. The tool has hurt you. But also, also, money is a tool depending in whose hands it is. Okay, let me give you an example. If, if a brick in the hands of a bricklayer builds a property, builds a house, doesn't it? Mm. But the same brick in the hands of a thief becomes a weapon. Oh, okay. Yes. So is money. Okay. Money in the hands of a Christian, a true Christian, remains a tool. Money in the hands of a humanist Someone who's not Christian, it's dangerous. You, you start, we've heard a lot about, 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 about spousal abuse when, when, when it's physical abuse, emotional abuse, but there's also financial abuse where money has landed in the hands of someone with an unrepented heart. Then they use it as a weapon. Suddenly, because your wife has not agreed with you, you don't pay DSTV, she can't watch Kim Kardashian. <laughs> you are using money as a, as a weapon. So during the sermon, I want us to talk deeply about, because it's going to be painful to teach Christians how to manage money and build wealth, and only to find out they were actually not Christians. Because mm. once they are wealthy, their true colors start to show. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All we right. thought we were teaching them about a tool. They were busy building a weapon so that they'll show. At some point now, because you are the one who, who pays the rent in the church, you're the one who pays for electricity, we no longer can discipline you. Yeah. The tool has become a weapon. Yeah. You are now untouchable. Not be very when was mad. Right. So money is a tool, Basal, and that's the point I'm making. It is a tool for us to take care of our families. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, we'll talk about it during the sermon. I'm just introducing this thing. Right. So let, let's skip some of these things. Now, one thing that I want us to, to pick up today, so the first one that I said we mustn't forget is that we must learn to use money to serve God, our master. Yeah. The second one I want us to pick is that Stewardship of money, financial stewardship, when it is complete, when it is complete, it doesn't only talk about tithe, offering, and charity. <coughs> because zero, 10 percent of zero is what? It's zero. It's zero. We can't do stewardship and ignore wealth. Because without wealth, there's no tithe. Without wealth, there's no offering. Without wealth, there's very little we can do towards charity. <coughs> so stewardship, when it is complete, 
It has these four pillars that talk about tithe, talks about offering, talks about charity, and it talks about wealth. We must not shy away to talk about wealth. And I know the reason we shy away to talk about wealth is because we've seen criminals who are wealthy, who abuse wealth. But as Christians, there's guidance around it. Now, what are God's expectations? And I think it's very important that whatever we talk about, if we remain Christians, we look at God's expectations and meet those. Now, what are his expectations when it comes to finances? I want to take you back to the time that Jesus was leaving his disciples. And we are in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You must understand the context of this verse when Christ is leaving. These disciples, and, and they even admitted themselves, were unlearned men, uncivilized. They were just fishermen. They were just, they were just fishermen. In fact, they were, so, they were so primitive that they even used strong language a lot. Like, that, that's just the kind of people they were. They were not people that you could associate with rabbis, where people you can walk with them in a temple, and they would probably sat at the back of the temple. And then Christ comes on the scene. Now Jesus makes these unpopular guys to appear popular. Suddenly, when they are walking, there's a crowd. Suddenly, when they are walking, the sick are healed. So it was nice to hang out with this Christ. And then this Christ dies. And then he goes to heaven. That must have been devastating for these guys. They are best friends, but also the person who made them to look cool is gone. And this is what Christ says in, in chapter 1, verse 8 in Acts. He says, but first he starts by saying, it is okay that I must leave so that the Holy Spirit, a helper, can come. Who will do more things than I did? Remember, Christ was limited by space, right? The Holy Spirit would get to, to everyone. Now look at this thing. He says this. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you shall be my witnesses. Not just in Judea, but through the ends of the earth. Remember that verse. Now, one thing I want us to, to realize about... Okay, let's not read Bona now. Let's read the Bible. Let's read the Bible. A witness in a court of law. Let's think about that scenario. Okay? You are in court and someone is your witness. In other words, I've been accused of killing somebody. Uh, I didn't kill anybody. I know you are recording. I did. It's, a, it's an example. It's an example. Hey, so we go Facebook. Like, to, to the killers are preaching in our local. No. <laughs> People are brave on Facebook. Okay, I see she left. Now, now, if I'm accused of killing somebody, and I say I didn't kill them, and then I say you are my witness, it means you are my witness, not the witnesses of those who are accusing me. So the evidence you deliver must at least contribute to proving me right. Are we okay with that definition? So when Christ is saying, you shall be my witnesses, He's, he's meaning that your life must deliver evidence that proves me right. Mm. I'm still okay with that. Mm. In other words, in other words if, if God says something in his word about finances, we must deliver evidence that proves that he's right. Mm. Are we okay to move with that? Mm. That's what it means to be a Christian. So let's see what he said about wealth. Well, when he talks about debt, this is what he has said. He says, when I have blessed you, you shall not borrow, but you shall lend. Okay. And then people say, it is impossible to live without debt. They explain all these other things. And then God then says, let me call Amma Sabata my witnesses. Was Anzoba for me, which is possible. Until you are God's witnesses. <laughs> Deliver then evidence that proves him right. He has made a statement there. He needs you to prove him right. Hey, <laughs> Sifig. Sifig, let's get some testimony. I just want to, I just want to thank the Lord that, that, that the bond has been approved. <laughs> Why don't you just sit down, finish the bond, and then come after 20 years and talk to us? God is saying, when I have blessed you, the evidence of blessing you is the absence of death. And then when are you saying, the evidence of blessing is the bond? God is saying, stewardship must help us to be credible witnesses. God must be able to rely on us. Right now, I don't think he can rely on many of us. But stewardship is useless if it doesn't get, out of, get, get us out of debt. Mm -hmm. It's useless. It's useless. If it only talks about tithe and doesn't care about the debt situation, it is making us a weak witnesses. God wants us to be credible witnesses. Stewardship must help us to be those. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's useless. Imagine spending eight hours in church and nothing has changed in your life. Mm -hmm. I could have read a book and become okay. Right. So, so, so it, also, it also then says, you know the thing of programs, it also says that those who lead the church must have 
um, a post-mortem every time after a problem. Just what have we achieved? Mm -hmm. Having done a strategy before, what do you want to achieve? Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's another story. And then he says what? He says, um, if you are in debt, the, the borrower becomes the slave of the lender. And we know God specializes in taking out his people from slavery. Mm -hmm. And this is what stewardship should do, practically, right? Of course, we can be happy that Ellen White is here. <laughs> now, you know, when you, go, when you go to Adventist home, page 393, go and read that page. If you want to know how to get out of debt, that page will tell you exactly how to get out of debt. And she talks about it. In fact, she calls debt. Look at this. She says, be determined to incur, not to incur another debt. Deny yourself a thousand things rather than run in debt. This has, this has been a curse in your life. Many people are calling debt good, calling debt a blessing. The prophet says it's a curse. Amen. It's a curse. I mean, how do you start evangelizing to your landlord when you owe rent? It really makes us weak, right? And then she says, how do I get it? She says you must avoid debt as, as someone avoiding smallpox. Obviously, back then, smallpox was a big thing. But the point she's making is that avoid debt as if it's a disease. Mm -hmm. And then she spends some time teaching you how to get out of debt. There is about eight steps here out of debt. I want you to go and read it for yourselves. And then she says, there's very few places where Ellen calls, calls something a great, a great victory. And getting out of debt is one of those. Read, it, read this. When you can stand forth a free man again, owing no man anything, you will have achieved a great victory. Yeah. So God's intention for us is to be out of debt. Mm -hmm. And he wants us to get to a point where we can be credible witnesses so that we can prove to the world that it is possible. Because God has said it. And that's our job. That's our job. Right. Anyway, let's keep this. We'll deal with it in the afternoon. And then the second thing. I want to show you that God has already spoken. Sorry, in, in the sermon. God has already spoken. God has already spoken about, about how to build wealth. The second thing that he talks about is that also take care of financial emergencies. Many of us can trace back our, 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 our being broke to a point where there was an emergency and I didn't have money for it. I had to borrow for that. A tire burst. It's 5,000 rents. You have to borrow. Somebody dies. Have you noticed that people, people don't die on the 25th? They die just when we are broke. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then we want those, those, those big funerals. You get into debt. So the Bible also teaches that the first pillar is that, please, man, please, get out of debt. The second pillar, take care of financial emergencies. Right? Now, if you go to Proverbs 6, verse 6, uh, I like it in my, in my language. Yeah. Look at the end. The end, here's the thing about the end, right? It understands that when it's winter, it's dangerous to go out and collect food. There might be no food in the first place, but also it's too cold to get food. So during summer, when all of you are throwing parties and celebrating that it's summer in my life, the end goes and collects food. Because she, know, she knows that it's not going to be summer all year long. Even in your life, you're not going to be in summer all year long. You're not going to be employed all the time. Yeah. What happens when you lose that job? Your business is doing very well. One time you'll be sitting in your lounge and you see your biggest data to a now we have also, uh, he committed a crime, but he owes you 50 million rents. It won't be summer all year long in your life. So the Bible then teaches us, let's learn from the end that when it's summer, it doesn't celebrate throughout summer, it saves some for winter. Because winter is coming and this is not a game of thrones. I'm just... <laughs> And then the third pillar, the third pillar, we talk about a holistic approach to, to financial stewardship. The third pillar is that, and it sounds obvious, spend less than you earn. And you think, but that's obvious. It's no longer obvious. Now back in the days, when, when I walked into a shop with my mother and I wanted a trouser, and we didn't have money, let's say the trouser was 60 rand, mm -hmm. and we had 40 rand, we would walk away without the trouser. Mm -hmm. Or we would lay by over three months, mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, late buying, uh, you must maintain your weight because when you get there, you must still feed your kids. You can change the size. Okay, so, so, so we would lay by. Okay, but think about today. Think about today now. Today, if I walk into a shop, let's say the trouser is 60 rand and I have 40 rands, I can walk out with a trouser, a belt, shoes, and a shirt because it has become easy to spend more than I earn. Because if I can't afford, they'll open an account. If I can't afford, they'll make a plan for me. It just becomes so easy to spend more than we earn. In fact, there are some people who believe available credit on their credit card is money. 
Right. So, so, so then it becomes important to spell it out and say, hi, Bo, spend less than you earn, pay. Right. Now, let me give you another example. If I were to send you to a shop to go and buy, I give you 7,000 reds cash. I say, go and buy a TV to watch Ellen write the movie, nothing else. So I give you 7,000 reds cash. I say, go and buy a TV. Right? Do you realize that when you are at the till and you are counting this man, you're going to start looking around, are you going to make a 5,000? Because as you see money going out, you feel it. Mm. But if you were to swipe, mm. you may swipe at 14,000. Mm. Mm. It has become easy to spend more than you earn that the Bible is also saying to us, be cautious, spend less than you earn. That's a dead pillar. That's a dead pillar. And if you were to find this in the Bible, Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 30, the Bible is saying, who, who amongst you, when, when planning to build a house, doesn't first count the cost so that they can check if they can afford to finish the house? Lest you start without counting the cost and then you run out of money when the house is fine halfway. And those who are walking will look and say, look, Look at this man who started something he couldn't finish. It's in the Bible. The Bible is saying, whatever we want to do, we have got dreams. We have dreams for our children. We want them to go to St. So and So School. We have dreams for our holidays. Don't just dream. Count the cost and plan and budget so that you can enjoy. Imagine, imagine a trip that's, that's, that, that's financed by debt. Mambu, we had Alama David orders. Every time you look at, at the photos, you get very angry because this was on debt. <laughs> Right. So, so can we plan our things? So the Bible is teaching about that. And then only, only when you've done these three, should you then start investing. <clears throat> now somebody's saying, no, but I can invest while I'm still swimming in debt. I will show you one day that it's not the most clever thing. Right. Now what does God say about wealth? Now if you go and read uh, Proverbs 13 verse 22, he says something very big. He says, a good person leaves an inheritance for his children's children. <sighs> Mm. The expectation is very high. Mm. The expectation is that we build generational wealth, not generational debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you would have thought, and, and you must understand, our parents, our parents lived in a time where they didn't get equal opportunities. They didn't get opportunities to participate in the economy. So they didn't make as much. That's why we sometimes have to take care of them. Mm -hmm. But it is painful that people now, today, Young people and not so young people who are still who are working very good jobs or running very good businesses, they are actually going to create the same situation at the end. Because we are busy chasing debt. Each time we, we resign from jobs, we cash our pension. By the time you're 65, your life is like this, but you don't have enough money in pension. Now your child must take care of you. Can we, can we break that cycle? Mm -hmm. And the Bible is trying to teach us that we should break that cycle. So that what I, what I leave my children is well, not more debt. And you've seen in other funerals where you think the wife is crying because this guy is dead. She's crying because she realized how much debt she's left in. Mm -hmm. Right. And this must not happen in the Adventist church. But it's not automatic. It's not automatic. Right. <clears throat> right. I'm going to skip all of this. <clears throat> what, what time? Okay, I've got 10 minutes. Got 10 minutes. All right. Let me tell you then, what is investing? Because most of the time, we think investing is such a, such a complex thing, right? And, and you've seen people like using jargon so that they're the only ones who do. Now, investing as defined, it says this. Investing is committing resources. Committing what? Resources. Did it say money? No. no. For a period of time to earn returns that compensate for the investment. Let's talk about resources. I want to show you that investing is accessible to everybody. Everybody. Look at this. One of the resources that we have. Can anybody say that? Yes, others are giving 24 hours. Minaji Bang Niga 12. We all have 24 hours, we all have time, we all have a resource called time. It is true that those who are using taxis spend a lot of their time commuting, unlike those who drive straight. But even that time commuting, some of us when we were commuting, we read books. We are investing in that time. Time is a resource, time is a resource. Um, you'll be surprised, you know, you know I, was, I was doing something, I saw that the amount of time people spend on TV and social media, by the time they are 65, an average person spends three hours watching TV. I don't count social media. By the time they are 65, they would have watched nine years worth of TV. Nine years spent on TV. You know, that's a degree and honors and a master's. <laughs> spent on TV. So time is a resource. Some of us are spending it, some of us are investing it. Now, 
The people you know. Nobody can say, I don't know anyone. Me. The network said, that's a resource we must invest. Instead of spending time with our friends gossiping about other people, can't we just spend time and see what solutions can we come up with that can make us money? Mm -hmm. Imagine if peer pressure was like that. We are putting each other under pressure to solve the problems of South Africa. And I'm going to show you the Adventist Church has all the solutions. It's just that the Adventist Church is not interested. What about this thing? Your skills. Exodus 35 verse 35. God says, I have filled them with all men of skills. All of us have been given something that we do better than anybody else. Okay. We've been given that. But guess what? We are busy comparing ourselves to other people. No, I want to be a doctor. Also. But you know you are scared of blood. It's not your colleague, but you want to go there. And then you ignore, then you ignore what God has planted in you. You ignore it totally. Um, one of, one of my, my sisters, she, I mean, eight. Them school is called the same school is called. Yeah. Big time. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> but 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 then we said, look, then the little joke no Africans, you about can't tell us. We took a blank, a blank piece of paper and said, what is it that you enjoy that you do so well? Write anything. If it's about looking after children, we'll interpret it. Mm -hmm. She writes, she writes, and, and I know that every time we are building, she likes to do things. It's like she, she fixes things, she does that. Well, that's your, she was already in grade 10. Then we say, okay, fine. Let's take you to a technical college where you're going to learn about electricity and other things. Because you seem to be good with your hands and stuff like that. Mm. She goes there. First exam, 80%. The person who used, used to get 10% suddenly is doing what God had already planted in her. And it comes naturally. You know, when you do something that, that, that comes naturally, we don't have to force you to sit down and get it done. Yeah. In fact, we get to a point where we say, you it's now. Yeah. God planted that, and we are busy living out of other people's bags. Mm. Right. This can make money. One thing that we said with her, she was now unemployed. Now she, she's finished now, she's unemployed. Obviously, <laughs> she so, so she's been starting to find a job. Then I say, okay, why don't you do this? Why don't you follow Uno Bagmas Bugo, who fixes electricity for people? But then he has a full time job during the week, he does it on weekends. I say, follow Bagmas Bugo, I'll give you money for transport. Just follow him. I'm a pocket loot. Right now, she now has her own clients and hires Mas Bugo for the complicated okay. things. But, but guess what? She invested her time. I'm trying to show you that investment has very little to do with money. She invested her time, she invested the relationship. Because invested in that relationship and then invested in her skill. Yeah. Suddenly she has the money. So investing Bazaran has very little to do with money. Yeah. <coughs> very little to do with money. Right. <clears throat> okay. Now the point that I was making, I'm gonna end now. The point I was making this morning is very simple. Stewardship is not just about type offering. And, and charity. Stewardship is about, it's holistic. Wealth is part of stewardship. We handle wealth as steward. And also, and also, I also wanna, wanna just make it very clear. Christianity is not a magic show. What do I mean by that? Christianity is not, I go and mess up everything, and then I pray, and then magic, everything is fine. If you read a lot of, a lot of um, parables, no, not parables, miracles that Jesus does, the miracles that Jesus performs, a lot of them, before he is faithful in the supernatural, the people have to be faithful in the natural. Yes. So, so, so he wants to resurrect Lazarus. That is the supernatural. But the removing of a stone is natural. Mm -hmm. yeah. The people have to be faithful. There is no miracle in moving a stone. He, he, the guys want to conquer Jericho, right? Mm. A miracle because it was known that those, those walls were, were strong. But there is no miracle in walking around the walls and singing. Yeah. Be faithful in the natural, and God will be faithful in the supernatural. So even the issues of finances, God is not going to do magic. This is not a magic show. He has given instruction. Be faithful in those instructions, and you'll be faithful in the, in the supernatural. Mm. That's, that's the important thing that I want to just say. That, that, that there's an expectation for us as Christians. You know, sometimes the answer to your prayer is an instruction to do something. Yeah. Not all prayers. Sometimes, after saying amen, God will tell you to go to a field and work yeah. and you'll get the food. Mm. It's not a magic show, this thing, Christianity. Mm. <coughs> right. So that's the point I'm making. But when it comes to wealth, we'll talk about tight offering in charity in the sermon. But when it comes to wealth, the first pillar 
please, let's, let's get out of debt. Let's really get out of debt. Debt weakens our, our testimony as people. And we've, we've, we've read some Ellen White, we've read some Bible. Emergencies. Emergencies, if we don't take care of emergencies. Now, now some people will tell you, Hi, brother, why? Why may I I mean, if you take out insurance and, and prepare for emergencies, shows that we don't, we, don't, we don't trust God. We don't trust God. In other words, I want to jump off the cliff to show that I trust God, he must catch me. Because the Bible, the Bible is teaching, it's Proverbs, I'll find it, I think it's 22 verse, verse 17 or something, but I'll find it, I'll find it. Where, where, where God is saying, is saying, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. Mm. A simple thing is to a who is to poor man, sees the same danger, but goes on blindly and suffers the consequences. God expects us when we can see danger approaching, then we must prepare for it. And part of preparing for it is saving for emergencies like the end. But part of it is taking out insurance. So when, when the emergencies happen, I'm okay, I don't run back into debt. Here's another one. Christ is on the mountain being tempted by, by, by the devil. And then the devil starts saying something very silly. He says, yes, yes, yes. And jump. It is written that he will send his angels to end the location. What does Jesus say? Says it's also written, you must not tempt the Lord your God. Yeah. Mm. If Jesus understood that when I see danger, I must take precautions and not, because some of us are just tempting the Lord. I, that's presumption. It's not faith. It's not faith. It's not faith. Right? So we'll talk about that another day. But the emergencies are important. We also spoke about spending less than you earn. And then he said, only when you've taken care of these things should you start investing to build wealth. Why is that? If you think about it, most of the debts that we are in, or oh, Edgazi, or oh, Banban, most of these debts, the interest account is about 20-21%. There's very few investments that can give you a return of more than 15%. Yeah. So in other words, you are earning 15, you are paying 20. That is a minus. How do you build wealth with a minus? Mm -hmm. so, so, so rather start getting out of this, and also making sure that you take care of emergencies. Because imagine you've invested somewhere and then an emergency happens. You must now cash your investments. You are cashing them at the wrong time. Because you didn't prepare for emergencies. Take care of this and make it a habit to spend less than you earn. And only then should you invest. Now, corner of the bank. Also, I might be in debt, but you are investor at least. You know what you are like? You are like a person who wants to lose weight. Okay, and then what do they do? They wake up in the morning and they run, they exercise, they exercise. They do the right thing. And then they spend the whole day with them up with. You've just reversed, you've just reversed what you started. God bless you, amen. amen.